So let's turn our, our topic away from, I think, HER2 positive disease, which is actually a, a, an area of quite success, that's been quite successful. So the treatment of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer has become a success story in the landscape of therapies and continues to expand owing to the advent of novel anti-HER2 targeted agents and multi-targeted HER2 receptor blockade. Let's look at some of the important data that have recently come out. Um, and before we do that though, you know, Sarah, you've been in at UCLA has really been at the forefront of a lot of this, you know, HER2. I mean, Dennis Slayman was there, he discovered HER2, and a lot of the really cool studies really have originated from there. And so you, could you kind of talk about a little bit about kind of where we are at least in the first line therapy and the management of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer? Yeah, so it's, I think we would all agree, kind of a fun type of disease to treat. We all kind of smile when we see we've been referred a patient with HER2 <coughs> positive first or second line metastatic breast cancer because it's fairly simple and the one thing that is so striking is the prognosis now for somebody diagnosed with first line disease is very good in terms of median survivals approaching five years now. So it's just not the depressing, horrible story that it was a decade or more ago. Um, the first study that really changed things in recent years is the Cleopatra trial, which evaluated dual HER2 targeting with trastuzumab and pertuzumab com combined with docetaxel in the frontline setting compared to docetaxel and trastuzumab. Patients received the chemotherapy portion for four to six cycles and then were allowed to come off of the chemo and just continue the HER2 targeted agent or agents. And in that study, the progression free survival was 18 months in the patients who received pertuzumab and trastuzumab together, uh, which was six months longer than patients who only received the trastuzumab. And the overall survival was about 16 months improved in the patients who received. So 56 and a half months, if I think, if I've got that right, That's right. It's 56, uh, compared five, to about 40. Four and a half years, yeah. five years almost. So it's, what's exciting is A, that women treated with this frontline regimen do have um, a median survival that's very good. Um, B, that the therapy is really well tolerated. The addition of pertuzumab to trastuzumab doesn't appear to increase cardiac toxicity. What I think clinicians need to be aware of is the fact that it increases the rates of diarrhea and skin toxicity, so you have to forewarn patients, especially when receiving the chemo portion. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, community oncologists drop off the pertuzumab Me too. somewhere around eight or nine Why? cycles because they Why? don't feel there's enough data. And the thing that I try, the message I try and get out to referring oncologists is it's, you know, follow the way the study was done. Yeah. The one exception to that is ER positive, HER2 positive. In the Cleopatra study, they didn't begin endocrine therapy with the dual HER2 targeted therapies in that study for ER positive disease. In my practice, I do, because I think dual blockade is probably beneficial, although I don't have data. So I think that has set the way now that all the guidelines support us using for first line HER2 positive the THP regimen. Does it matter whether you use docetaxel or paclitaxel? Probably not, and we now have data that paclitaxel um, is, is probably just as good, so it's really a, a preference um, based on, on patient and timing and, you know, your perceived side effects and the known side effects of each of the therapies. Okay. And the coordination of timing of the infusions is more exactly, complicated. Exactly, much more complicated. Because of the every three-week pertuzumab. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is interesting in uh, Cleopatra that almost everybody was in the first-line setting, uh, but I mean, not every first-line, but not treatment naive. De novo. And I, yeah, I think 90%. that, you know, we treat people really <coughs> heavily, and if we're going to give them even more therapy in the adjuvant setting, we may not be seeing that same benefit in some of those patients, but hopefully those patients are not going to recur. So, Right. A lot of our registry data sets, some that you've presented, show that you know, de novo metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer is, is much higher than we previously, yes. previously right. thought. Which is the same thing with ER positive. Yeah. I, mean, I never would have thought that, especially in a North America, U.S., mm -hmm. yeah. it was that much. So we have that. So we, I think we all agree that pertuzumab in that setting is good. But the other major drug that you know that you've been very involved in as well you know, is TDM1. So, right. um, so TDM1 is trastuzumab stably linked to uh, metancine, which is a, a microtubule uh, toxin 
very potent, but it's not released until um, the trastuzumab, which is linked to it, is internalized in the HER2 overexpressing cancer cell. When within the cell, it's released. So it's truly targeted delivery of the chemotherapy to the HER2 overexpressing cancer cell. And the end result is a much less toxic delivery of chemotherapy. Some people call it a non-chemotherapy regimen. I disagree entirely with that. This is real chemo, and there are side effects that we need to watch for, including thrombocytopenia and liver enzyme elevation. Um, the Amelia study um, is the study that established this drug as the standard of care for second and third line breast cancer, comparing TDM1 to lapatinib plus capecitabine, and again, not only an improved progression-free survival, but a much better overall survival in patients treated with TDM1, as well as much less toxicity. And then the Teresa data, which were presented at San Antonio, showed, again, in the beyond second line setting, an improved overall survival uh, for patients treated with TDM1 compared to uh, treatment of physician's choice. So would you therefore, I'm curious the panel, would you then use TDM1 at any line, as long as someone's never had it, mm -hmm. based on that data? Teresa's physician's choice, right? Was second to fifth now, line or something like that? One thing that's interesting about Teresa, uh, where there was a very nice survival advantage, which is great to see, Patients were required to have prior trastuzumab right. and prior lapatinib. Exactly. Okay? Really? Prior lapatinib? Yes. And I think that's an important point because you get this big survival advantage with the TDM1 after the lapatinib. Now, we don't have any data on the TDM1 after pertuzumab. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so I actually um, utilize that particular fact in my practice based on my experience that I see the beautiful TDM1, you know, multi year responses. Um, not necessarily right after pertuzumab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't. I have so you'll seen interrupt not, and give like some other regimen in between. Like lapatinib. Mm -hmm. Oh, lapatinib. Okay. I do it like the Teresa. Mm. Okay. Not you know. So anyway, I just want to make that point. I think we need some data. I'd like to see thought. some data because that's a very important agent. And these ladies can sit on that drug for years. You know what I mean? And uh, it's got a nice survival advantage. But we do have a, a data. We need some data. But there, how are you basically. using the lapatinib? Are you using it with capecitabine? Um, <coughs> yes, either with capecitabine or um, trastuzumab. Trastuzumab. Just, just trastuzumab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you have, I mean, you have the trial that is capecitabine lapatinib versus TDM1 mm -hmm. with a significant advantage yeah, so. of TDM1. Correct. So how would, why would you put right, that on pertuzumab pretreated they weren't patients? Pertuzumab pre that's Correct. what Joyce, that's a good point. Joyce. It is. And you know, I, I do wonder if the resistance to pertuzumab does change disease, having had one patient just have this massive progression after two doses of TDM1 who's been alive with HER2 positive metastatic disease for 15 years, you know? And I, so you do wonder, you know, there's, uh, there are those patients, and even when we were doing the phase two trials, who just didn't respond at all. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you don't get these people who say, I have another patient who's been on for five years on TDM1, so. And well, who knows what mutations and the targets yeah. they were yes, on now. And awesome it has some EGFR activity, mm -hmm. right. so it is somewhat similar to. Yeah. The other thing I've point. noticed is if I've yeah. used uh, trastuzumab and navalbine, I'm not getting responses to TDM1, and I wonder if it's the same mm. vinca really? alkaloid That's kind of uh, chemotherapy interaction that they're, they're just not as so responsive. after TDM1 or after pertuzumab? If I've used venerelbine. If, if I've so used venerelbine, venerelbine, trastuzumab. Yes, and then, then go to TDM1. TDM1 after, one, you don't get a response. I'm not getting responses. But also, if I see people who are truly taxing refractory, they don't get as much of a response yeah. either. So very refractory, you know, like really got two years of a taxane, really grew on everything. So, so maybe that's part of it. So TDM1's great for